to Russian influence. We are on location at the Athenaeum Theatre on Collins Street, Melbourne. We are about to interview Anastasia Kogan, who is on board of directors of Melbourne Opera. Anastasia, it's such a pleasure for us to have you as a guest on Russian Influence. Thank you so much for being a guest on our show. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. And thank you for organizing the theater. It's such a beautiful historical building. Yes, whenever we get a chance to pop by, especially during the day when there is no production and it's quiet and you get to, you really get to enjoy the building. It is a special moment. So. Yeah, I really feel the magical atmosphere. The vibe. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Please tell us, where were you born and when did you come to Australia? I was born northern part of Russia, but I was quite little when we moved. Uh, we moved totally opposite to, to the south region and it's near the Black Sea. People might know Sochi as one of the cities that's, that's in the area. So, and I'm from Krasnodar, which is like a Brisbane to yep. Gold Coast and yep. Sochi mm -hmm. is a Gold Coast to Krasnodar. I came here when I was 17, many, many years ago. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like for you? Because adapting to the new country, culture, learning the new language. Yeah, look, it was exciting. And I think it was a really good time as well for my, for my mother to make a decision, you know, for me to move um, what year straight was after it? high school. So it was year 2000. Yep. And I finished high school in Russia. So it was a it was a good time because you do have such a massive change in your life going from high school to university so a lot of friends um, from school did go um, either move to different countries or move to different cities so there was that um, social change and also when I moved here it was just before the Olympic Games and it was so exciting <laughs> because um, you know we moved to Sydney not to Melbourne and it was just full of buzz and full of people it was so busy it was so exciting and you know every day you go out to Darling Harbour or Circular Quay or something and it's just and you know Darling you see Harbor so many so spectacular exactly you see so many different cultures and so many different people and you know getting to go and see some sports it was just something that I been from a smaller town in Russia something that I have never witnessed so it was mm. exciting when do you develop your love for music oh I mean as a every Russian child you mm. just born loving it <laughs> <laughs> you know you go to a music school after school I did piano um, and violin for a little bit and then went back to piano and then you know you never think that it's going to be your career path or I didn't think I'd have anything to do with music after I finished school so it was quite surprising I think I was around 20 and I thought mm, I actually want to work in the music industry or in the entertainment industry. Yeah. And what university did you go to and what did you study? I've got a Bachelor of Music and I also have an MBA from uh, Melbourne Business School. Mm, impressive. Yeah. Wow. You've got <laughs> so the, a bit arts, different, a the bit different. arts and the business. Yeah that's, yeah, that's terrific. And what did you major in in your music degree? It was arts management. So I always wanted to um, be behind the scenes and um, working on productions and working on making things happen. I, I thought I had an eye mm -hmm. for, um, for certain things and creativity is one of the, one of the traits that I've um, developed as I was younger and I enjoy all the creative work that I do mm -hmm. now. And straight after uni, my first job was with um, Sony Music and then um, I ended up kind of falling into being a stylist for Jessica Marboy and working as an wow. assistant manager mm -hmm. for her and for Human Nature. And from there, that again... That must have been very interesting. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a really good time because, uh, you know, Jess just signed with Sony at that time and she had a couple of years to work on her mm -hmm. album and mm -hmm. a lot of freedom. So we got to improvise and you know, try different things. It started out with, you know, wearing mine and hers mm. wardrobe and, you know, just playing dress ups. And the more events we 
well, she got invited to and the more popular that she was yeah. becoming as you know as you know um, a lot of people wanted to collaborate with us it was really nice to have inbound <laughs> inquiries mm -hmm. coming through and from there we were on the set of um, music video for one of her songs and I just loved that environment so mm -hmm. I thought I, I want to be in filming like that's the part of the business mm -hmm. I want to um, end up in. Doing well, right now. what are your yeah, projects? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> when it started. Um, that's when it started. I I loved filming. I loved everything to do with that, and I loved fashion still. Mm -hmm. A few of the fashion designers approached me to have uh, content filmed for them during fashion weeks. Yeah. And then after a few of those, somebody from New York messaged me and on YouTube, and they said, you know, do you work in New York? Would you be interested in filming New York Fashion Week? It's like, of course I work yeah. in New York. <laughs> <laughs> booked my flights and off I was yes. and that was an quite an experience an eye-opening experience as well it's just you know anything I've seen here in Australia was so lovely and creative and I thought fast-paced but when you go to the Big Apple you realize that you lived very slow life <laughs> everything was just so fast and there's one show after another it took me a day or so to adjust and you know after that you're like okay on yep. the ball and you know that was an an experience that kind of showed me all right this is not just about fun and and fashion and you yeah, know you have to have dress strong ups. work ethic it's yeah. a bad business mm. yes a work ethic is one of those from there somehow ended up with a lot of um, motivational speakers and marketing conferences I started to love the business side of things even more than the creative side of things so ended up going and getting my MBA and working more on strategy now so content strategy positioning and things like that for brands and from there you might end up uh, producing some beautiful content you might you know decide that you need something a little bit more streamlined and that's where we're at right now <laughs> such a high achiever please tell me about this new stage in your life about the board of directors of opera and You're how did you kind. get involved in it look I fell in love with opera uh, a few years ago I was doing my exchange for business school the last term we, we got to choose a school and go somewhere and study for a few months overseas so I chose Paris um, I was really interested in uh, brand management, particularly luxury brand management, and Paris is where it's from. I was living just two blocks away from the opera house there. And in Paris, you have this thing for youth and for last minute tickets where you can get a really nice seat for like eight euros <laughs> <laughs> to see an opera or ballet, you know, whatever is happening yeah. at the theater at that time. Just being in that historic building, being wrapped in this beauty and and the depth um, yeah. of culture was just inspiring so following that I traveled a bit in um, Italy and it was an opera festival um, in Verona very very mm -hmm. famous festival uh, the operas are held at the uh, Verona arena it's you know Roman arena yeah. <laughs> very very old and the scenes How much themselves, more grandiose can this just, get? You yeah. can't, mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And I saw Aida there for the first, well, not for the first time, I've seen it at the Opera House before, but at the Verona <laughs> Amphitheatre, you've got a chorus of like 400 people. It was incredible. There were horses and animals mm -hmm. and fire, and it, it's just the spectacle was on the next level. It sounds so powerful. Yeah. It was, and I thought, oh, if I get a chance, I'd, I'd love to do something in this space. And last year, you know, you talk to people and somehow one conversation led to another. 
and Melbourne Opera were looking for somebody with um, marketing um, uh, background. knowledge, background, mm -hmm. to join their board and I love the opera or newly, uh, new love of the opera and we had meetings, we spoke for about six months about the role and what I could bring and what they wanted out of me and yes, it's almost a year now that I've been with Melbourne Opera. Congratulations yeah. and I really admire you that you did not waste that COVID year 2020. <laughs> you were actually uh, very, very busy. Yes, and it's, I'm so happy that it is Melbourne Opera because the team is just so dynamic and so lean. Um, so we are self-funded, we don't get much help from the government and a lot of planning is up to the team that mm. runs it. So we, I don't know if it's calculated gamble you might say, but we decided not to cancel our 2021 season and we did, we did have to postpone something yeah. from late last year onto early this year, but we had our uh, Ryan Gold, uh, Wagner's Ryan Gold performed on 3rd of Feb at the Regent Theatre. And that was the Fabulous. first thing, uh, first performing yeah. arts show happening in Victoria for almost a year. So it was such incredible. an incredible time. And, you know, being in a position where you are providing opportunities for artists and musicians when nobody else was doing anything, was quite exciting. So um, I'm happy that um, I ended up with this company. What is your vision? Like, what are you hoping to achieve? Opera is a, is, is a musical genre that I think we get to appreciate as we get a bit older. Just by, you know, sheer luck and where I was at the time that I got to know it earlier on. My dream is for younger audiences to get to know it, to understand it, and to want to participate and, and you know, see the wonderful productions that we put on and other opera houses put on. So that's where it's at. If someone asks you that question, like, if I go to opera, like younger audience, but it's all in Italian. Well, what would you say? <laughs> look, um, operas, they're not just in Italian. Mm. You have, um, uh, you have uh, German operas, of course. There are Russian operas, in mm. fact, and we're uh, thinking about putting something on towards the end of Ooh. the year. And, That's exciting. Um, yeah, so whenever it is in a foreign language, you actually have a screen going with the um, subtitles. Yeah. So you always know what's going on. As an opera genre, there's a lot of lines that get repeated. So sometimes people say, why do they say the same thing over and over <laughs> again? I'm, you know, and well, actually, because a lot of people don't understand yeah. and they get to read in that time and still mm -hmm. don't miss anything mm -hmm. on stage. But also, um, you know, a friend of mine said, well, I've already read on Wikipedia the whole synopsis, so I know what the story is like. So, you know, what's the point? And w what I say to that is, and Julia, you, they die. you yeah. actually should, <laughs> yeah. you actually should mm -hmm. read. Um, about the opera before you go and see it. It's a good idea to know the storyline because the beauty of, um, you know, sitting in the theater like this and watching the opera, it's not just knowing what happens in the storyline, but it's the journey that the yeah. actors and uh, performers take you on and the musicians. And voice, every time it's different. Yeah. So, you know, like why, you know, people go and see the same opera in different cities. Um, performed by different opera companies because they want to see different production. They want to see a different take on the same story from costumes to arrangement to decorations and you know all this um, setting on stage. It's always different. <laughs>said to you something about now or never what would that be for you now or never <sighs> look um, the best example I can give so far is being able to or not being able but going somewhere and traveling when you can after the first lockdown back in June I went from so I'm now based in Melbourne but I still have my mum lives in Sydney and I still have a lot of friends in, in, in Sydney so I got on the flight the first day that we were allowed and people said look why don't you wait a few weeks when everything settles down and go then I said no it's now, now or, or never, never. <laughs> and I went 
for a few days and I came back and we went into a second <laughs> lockdown where we couldn't leave the house for five months or four months, whatever it was, felt like eternity. What is your favorite um, historical era? There's a really good movie uh, called Midnight in Paris with Owen Wilson and I think uh, Marion Cotillard. It shows a writer, goes through a, a story of a writer who just dreams about being in, um, in a um, different era to him. Yeah. And he's just enchanted by it and he's like, if only I could live there. And somehow he manages to get there. And he meets this lady who inspires him to write better. And he meets all the other enlightenment. So this lady, she dreams about the epoch before, the Belle Epoque, <laughs> you know, where it was uh, Toulouse-Lautrec and, uh, you know, the music was a little more, it had more oomph and people from that era, they end up going there. They, they remember the Renaissance and the Baroque. So you always think there was something somewhere that's better than now. And it actually made me think no better era than now for, with scientific advancements, medicine, you know, being able to brush your teeth with an electric mm -hmm. toothbrush and going, you know, bathroom and having a, you know, shower and all of those things. And, you know, if you're sick, having headache and, and tummy ache, whatever medicine just at your fingertips is amazing. And none of those people back then had it. So definitely uh, now is the time. I do have a time or an era that intrigues me. Mm, and that's the time it? of um, uh, Marie Antoinette, the earlier time before she got mm. beheaded. <laughs> and I just think if you could go for a day and be a fly on the wall in Versailles, um, you know, early or like mid 1700s, that would be an interesting time just to see the development of fashion and culinary experiences and um, art. So that would be an interesting time to visit. <laughs> Anastasia, what is your favorite musical era, if you had to choose? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know era, I definitely have a, a like favorite artist from a different era. I love Frédéric Chopin's music. Uh, I, I just think it's so melodical and um, takes you on a journey and really speaks to me. So I, I love Debussy, I, you know, I love all of these melodic piano pieces they take you somewhere and then bring you back a happier person. Cool. And what is your most favorite city in the world and why? <laughs> that, that, I guess um, a, a lot of favorite things kind of happen for me up there in, uh, in Europe. I love where I am now, of course. Um, I think Melbourne is a beautiful city that has so much, you know, from sports to food to art and culture and like build, building my family here as well, so that's fantastic. Sydney is definitely in the top three. I think it's the most beautiful city in the world and every time, you know, I catch a flight, Melbourne to Sydney and you land, you usually go over the circular key in the Opera House and I always take a photo, post it <laughs> to my international friends, look what we have. And then, oh, I love Paris. You know, living there just opened my eyes on so many things and learning about how much of our Western culture and history comes from Paris, um, really important. And um, Rome would be one of, well, one of the favorites as well. What's your fascination with Rome? The ancient times, um, you know, if I wanted to see what Marie Antoinette is doing, I would definitely want to see what Julius Caesar or maybe, you know, a hundred years later, what Hadrian did, you know, when um, they were building the Colosseum or the Pantheon. It's just, again, I think that would be an interesting time to visit because a lot of the innovation 
came at that time and we're still using them. So roads, for example, Romans were the ones building proper roads between um, uh, cities and towns. So um, the infrastructure. The infrastructure, yeah. mortar, right? So we're still using some of it and we don't understand. Um, I think they keep trying to find the recipe or in which proportions do you mix things together to make it as strong and they still can't find it. Again, with the Pantheon, that building is so amazing. Like if you ask me what's your favorite building, mm -hmm. that would be that. It's simple, it's beautiful, and it's world's first largest standalone dome. That's um, again took like ingenuity for the architect to come up with and then to build, yeah. and it's still standing. The columns are original. No other city in the world can show us yeah. so much about us from back then as Rome can. I think after this, people will be booking their tickets to Rome <laughs> as soon as they get immunized. <laughs> yes, I hope they do. <laughs> After com uh, coming to the opera performance at the Athenaeum Theatre and then Rome afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. our next production is Macbeth at the end of May. And again, really excited yeah. to have people. Shakespeare lovers. Yes, yeah. uh, people back um, out um, enjoying um, enjoying what our artists and mm. musicians um, are working on so hard mm. right now. Mm. It will be at Her Majesty's Theatre. Mm. What is the most unique experience you've ever had? Unique experience? That's a really good question. It's hard to choose, I think. Maybe skydiving. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> are you serious? I, I would say... Um, you are dead, devil. <laughs> Yes, I'd say skydiving because somewhere at around age of 15, I became really scared of flying and heights. And it was very strange to me because I spent a lot of my childhood flying. My dad worked for the airlines, so, you know, we traveled at, uh, all the time. And sometimes they'd put me on the plane. I would go with, in the cockpit with the pilots. Wow. from you know point what a to experience. point b and you know i loved it and all of a sudden just that's it i would i was like terrified being on the plane and i remember filming something for one of my clients they had a day out trip uh, in wollongong near sydney and they were like facing your fear day out trip and they were skydiving so I'm like, okay, we're filming, you know, it's great. Like, this is what we're doing. And then, <laughs> then my client says, well, you're one of the people that will skydive. And I said, no, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm scared of planes. I'm scared of heights. N no. And of course, under peer pressure, I said yes. And I remember being on that little plane and they're doing the circles to get the height. And... I was so scared to be on that plane that I said to my tandem partner, the, the instructor, let's just jump, let's <laughs> jump, I cannot be on this plane anymore. And you know, they opened the door and that was the second most scariest experience. <laughs> and I'm like, let's it, I'm going. <laughs> so we jumped and you fly and that was such a stress relief because it was so scary to be, to be up in the air. And the moment the parachute opens, you just feel that kick and you just glide like a bird and that was that was quite incredible and so when we landed there was another set of parachutes left and i said oh did somebody chicken out can i go again as a joke and the instructor said well actually yes you can somebody did decide not to go and because when i like, when i landed it felt so surreal i didn't even think it happened i said you know what i'll go again i'll go again and this time i won't be jumping first i'll see other people jumping so it's i take it in so we got back on the plane and it's scary again, but I'm still a bit dazed. And I see other people jumping out. And this time that was the scariest thing because it's so not natural mm -hmm. to have people just leaving the plane midair. <laughs> <laughs> and that was quite scary. And second time we jumped out, like I really took everything in and realized what was happening. And since then, not, af not afraid mm -hmm. to fly on the planes anymore. Well, thank you so much for your time today and thank you for appearing on Russian Influence. Thank you, and Lina. It was, it was great to be here. We wish you all the best. For thank the you. Same to you.